Tonight's speaker is Ben Bolden. Ben is a historian of Fort Smith history who wrote a weekly column for the Southwest Times Record, the daily newspaper there. The column was chiefly focused on the city's history and provided much of the material for the book he wrote, uh, The Hidden History of Fort Smith, and was published in 2012 by Arcadia Publishing. He earned a bachelor's degree in history from the University of Missouri in 1986 and a master's degree in history from the University of Arkansas in 1992. Bolden has taught courses in Arkansas history and American history uh, in the Gilded Age. He served as vice president of the Fort Smith Historical Society, worked on the Society's journal, and created www.fortsmithhistory.org, the Society's website. He served four years on the board of the Fort Smith Museum of History, including as its president. Bolden is a native of Fort Smith and spent most of his life there before moving to Little Rock in the spring of 2012. Please help me welcome Ben Bolden. Hello, thanks for coming out on uh, probably our coldest week in a long time. Uh, when Danielle uh, uh, called me about, uh, I think you called me, uh, about, doing, about doing this, I, uh, I hadn't lectured in Fort Smith history in a long time. We've lived in Little Rock six years now. So I was kind of not directly, but mentally equivocating whether I wanted to really do it or not. And I asked, uh, I asked uh, Danielle what date, and she said November 13th. And I thought, wow, that is kind of weird because uh, November 13th is a real pivotal date in what I'm going to be talking about to, to today, which is, and today is the 101st anniversary of the first vote by a woman in a public election in the South. And that was in Fort Smith because Arkansas was the first state to allow women to vote uh, in the South. And uh, that now that was only in party primaries, but the first election, they passed that law in March 1917. First election uh, is November, special election, November 1917. And uh, so 101 years ago today, uh, a woman I'll tell you about in a little bit, um, cast the first vote and, uh, in, in the South. And I called this, uh, when I first developed this six years ago, this lecture in conjunction with my book, I called it Southern with Spine, because we think of uh, sometimes, there, there, well, there are two kinds of stereotypes of, say, especially antebellum women. There's the strong woman, the scarlet, and, uh, and the melody. And uh, I think uh, probably a lot of the Fort Smith, Fort Smith women I'm talking about, they're probably more scarlet than, than melody. And uh, if you're a devotee of Gone with the Wind, you'll probably get what I'm talking about. So I'm going to run through like some of these women really quickly. Some of them we don't know a lot about or only know a little about, and then some we know more about. So you can find more about them online. I'll be glad to talk to you, tell you what I know about some of them. But I want to give you some context about sort of a, the tradition among women in Fort Smith and, and uh, their own history. So uh, when I get to the 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 heart of it you'll have have something to kind of measure it by so the first recorded boat, uh, birth in fort smith was this woman a, a case in point one we don't know a lot about but uh sarah ann ticknell who uh is december 23rd 1823 approximately six years after the first boat full of soldiers load landed in fort smith and then uh not long after that the sisters of mercy uh, arrived and established St. Anne's and uh, what would eventually be St. Edward and now is Mercy Fort Smith. Uh, so a long tradition of uh, pioneering women in health care, especially in, uh, in, from, the, from the Catholic denomination. Uh, Sophia Barling Kennedy, another early settler. If you know Fort Smith at all on Garrison Avenue, Fifth and Garrison, there's a, a bar near there now, but that's where Sophia Barling Kennedy had her house now. That might not be interesting to too many people here, but in Fort Smith, this idea of, of, of homes on Garrison Avenue is just a little weird. Um, so uh, those are some of the early women who settled in Fort Smith, and these are some women I'm a little more familiar with in the 19th century in Fort Smith. Um, Kate Sandals was not born in Fort Smith, but moved there fairly early in her life, was a, was a physician in uh, in the 19th century, 
and the first female juror that we know of in the world and, and was, uh, had to be legally declared a person to, to serve on the jury, a person under, under I guess, American common law. Uh, and, uh, but she settled in Fort Smith. She practiced as a physician in Fort Smith and um, married, had four children, uh, stepped back from medicine to raise her children, and as far as I know, didn't practice again, but a pretty notable person in her own right. Uh, Many Sanders Armstrong. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I, I mixed them up. So it shows you how long I've been doing that. Uh, she, she was the federal court official. Uh, that's how I mixed them up. Many Sanders Armstrong, my wife's maiden name. <laughs> no relation. She was the first female physician. Now she was born in in, uh, in Illinois. Um, Ella Carnall. If any of you have been to Miss Ella's in. Uh, in Fayetteville, it's a really great restaurant and I guess B&B &B um, on campus there. Ella Carnall was uh, the, the uh, niece of John Carnall. It's an elementary school, streets named after him. Uh, he was early, helped plaid a lot of the original Fort Smith and uh, one of the first, the first female professor at the UA. Um, there's a connection here, John Carnall had a crush on this woman when she was, uh, I think, in her late teens in Fort Smith. Um, but uh, Venita, Oklahoma is named for her. And Vinnie Ream, she lived in, spent a lot of her formative years in Fort Smith. And there's a very famous, I think it's in the rotunda, the U.S. Capitol, uh, sculpture of, of Lincoln. And Vinnie Ream sculpted that and uh, uh, was was quite remarkable in her day. And uh, I read that during the impeachment trial of, of uh, Andrew Johnson, she had her, I think she was working on the Lincoln statue at the time, she had her, uh, they let her set up a sculpting studio in the Capitol building. And a lot of senators and people would stop by. And so when they were conferring behind the scenes, kind of smoke-filled rooms on the Johnson impeachment, um, that's where they would be. They'd meet in her studio because it was kind of off the beaten track, and and uh, no one knew they were uh, knew where they were. Now this is uh, Thyra Sampter Winslow. Uh, is particularly interesting uh, to me. She was a friend of Dorothy Parker's. If you're familiar with her, she uh, was a protege of H. L. Mencken's. Um, Jewish girl from Fort Smith went off. Uh, we think maybe did some acting. There's like a 10 year period in there where we're kind of not real sure what she was doing, but eventually had stuff published in uh, American Mercury with H.L. Uh, Mencken, uh, New Yorker. And there's a book called, um, I'm trying to think of her collection of short stories. In any case, she, uh, she uh, uh, had it uh, collected and published. And it's a book that the, Fort Smith Public Library now only has enclosed stacks because it would disappear. Someone would check it out or steal it and destroy it. They'd have to get another copy. Someone would steal it and destroy it. And the reason is because she took all the gossip she heard in Fort Smith, fictionalized it slightly, and turned them into stories. So the stories about uh, interracial romances, things like that, that uh, were sort of thinly disguised. And apparently there were some families in Fort Smith that were so scandalized by it, they didn't want anyone in the town to read the book. And uh, there was a woman in Fort Smith I knew who once sat down with uh, someone even older than her herself and, and went through e each story and decrypted it and got the re who the people really were. and. She always promised me she lost it, <laughs> literally lost the list, and she promised me she would, if she ever found it again, sadly she passed away a couple years ago, she would let me know, but uh, you can still make some guesses as to who, who some people were, and what's interesting is uh, she was, let me see if she's next, yeah, this is a woman born in Fort Smith, Catherine Alexander, she was in a bunch of movies, had an even more lucrative, uh, successful career on Broadway, and I can't prove that they even really were friends, 
But it, I find it really a striking coincidence that Spiver Samter Winslow wrote a movie, she spent some time in Hollywood, called She Married Her Boss. It was with Claudette Colbert. I've uh, never seen it. But Catherine Alexander is also from Fort Smith, and she, there she is. She's in She Married Her Boss. Now, I'd love to know what uh, that story. I'll probably never get the answer. But uh, I interviewed her niece. If you know Ke Fort Smith at all, Kelly Highway, uh, Kelly Harry Kelly Park. Catherine Alexander was uh, related by marriage to the Kellys. Um, her sister married Lee Kelly. Yeah, that's right. And Gordon Kelly, her her niece, was the woman I interviewed, and she said that uh, that her aunt was fearless. Uh, the only person she was afraid of, uh, the only thing she was afraid of, was being seated at dinner next to Dorothy Parker. But uh, uh, and uh, funny story, just a quick one. Uh, the last professional production she was in, she uh, was uh, the London cast production of Death of a Salesman, and Paul Muni was playing um, the lead. Now I can't, I can't think of the name now. What is this? any any case? Yeah, Willie Allman, thank you. Um, Paul, Paul Mooney, Mooney was playing Willie Loman, and uh, he didn't go to rehearsals. He sent in a recording with his lines. And, and Catherine Alexander was so fed up by that, she said, this is it, I'm, I'm, I'm done. Also, she had a stalker on that who would come to every play and would sit on the front row and just stare at her and then... And then leave her flowers. So I think between Paul Muni and the stalker, she was just like, I, I, I'm out of here. But you can see her in a lot of, uh, she did movies in the 30s. She had, I saw her in a Cary Grant movie one time. Uh, but if you pay attention on TCM, you can probably, probably find something. Uh, I actually met her, but I was like 10 maybe, I don't know. But I, I, I wish I had uh, a thousand questions I'd have for her now. Uh, and then there are the, the women we don't hear so much about of the, what I would say, the under and working classes of Fort Smith who don't leave a, a lot of documentary, uh, documentary evidence or very long trail behind, but uh, nevertheless, uh, they left their mark. Uh, one of the stories in um, Thyra Samter Winslow's book, one of the short stories is about Pearl. Now, people often confuse Belle and Pearl. Belle was from Missouri, famous outlaw, the outlaw queen. And uh, uh, she was killed at, I think, 39, murdered in an unsolved mystery. Uh, there's much speculation as who killed her, but her daughter, she was never a prostitute. She had several husbands, uh, uh, and uh, including Sam Starr. Uh, she was born Myra Belle Shirley. But her daughter, Pearl Starr, was a madam in Fort Smith, and and quite, um, quite renowned uh, in, in that profession. And then um, I want to step back for a minute and give you some context. It's hard to believe this now, but in the early part of the 20th century, 100 years ago, Fort Smith was a, and Van Buren too, was a virtual hotbed of union activity and, and, and socialist organizing. Uh, if you can imagine such a thing. And um, the, uh, in 1914, the um, Franklin Bage, who had the Bage Denman Mining Company, uh, resolved to break the union, the UMW, United Mine Workers. And he, it's kind of the opposite of a strike. It's a lockout, basically fired everyone, fired the union, uh, tried to bring in scabs. And one of my favorite stories is um, the, the, the union was enjoined from being on the mine property. You know, obviously they couldn't destroy any mine property, but they sabotaged some mines, destroyed some equipment. And some men were arrested. And a U.S. deputy marshal came down to South Sebastian County on a train, arrested a bunch of them, had them in leg irons, was putting them on the train. And a whole bunch of men, some of them in masks, all of them with either clubs or shotguns, came up. They took the men off, and the, the ringleader said to the deputy marshal, said, if you want a bootlegger, 
we'll bring you one, but you ain't ever taken a coal man. And, <laughs> and that's where I get that from. They uh, eventually brought in the U.S. Cavalry. There was a big legal fight that went dragged on into the 1930s, but uh, eventually, I believe, Bates, uh, the, the resolution was kind of murky in terms of what its ultimate result was. But Bates, uh, um, I think, eventually had to knuckle under and at least uh, let some of the union back in. So, uh, so there were strikes. There were unions in um, Fort Smith, sort of unionizing professions you would never imagine, like retail clerks, bartenders, uh, barbers, all, all had unions. And they built, uh, uh, you can kind of see it in the background in one of the pictures. Uh, they all got together and pulled their money. They built, even had a building called the Labor Temple uh, where, where they would share meeting space, like the carpenters would meet on the third Thursday and the plumbers would meet on the second Wednesday and that kind of thing. Um, and in uh, 1917, I don't remember the chronology right, early 1917, the uh, women at the Holland American Fruit Company, who had been getting a piece rate, uh, they were just packers. They would pack, pack fruit. And um, they wanted an hourly wage. They wanted uh, uh, a set, like, nine-hour work day. And they wanted, uh, oh, overtime, when they went over nine hours uh, each day. And... There was a big strike, and they won. And they got, get this, get how much money? A dollar ten a day. But believe it or not, that was uh, uh, that was an improvement over what they had been earning in in a piece rate. Well, I don't know if uh, you're probably familiar with uh, in old movies and things, or uh, if you even have a living memory that goes back that far. I do, of at least a switchboard. Uh, Basically, telephone operators being a pretty female-dominated, uh, uh, you know, occupation, because the young men were rude. <laughs> that's who they, <laughs> that's who they originally employed, and the phone company eventually found they got complaints because people would they would get smart remarks back. You know, you can imagine, yeah, ask a 19, 20 year old for some information or a number, and so gradually they just had more and more women working because they were, they had they didn't they didn't pop off as much as the you know, the young men would. So uh, it became a female-dominated uh, profession. And I don't know that the telephone operators were necessarily inspired by the Holland American uh, companies, the, the women who struck there. But they very well might have been, because they saw an all-women union striking, getting better wages and conditions. And um, so two of the women at the Southwestern Bell Telephone Company in Fort Smith started to organize a union and, and were successful. The women all agreed that they needed one. And um, me, I'm sorry, got a little ahead of myself there. And um, so the phone company didn't like that, of course, and they fired the two women. And the, their sort of sisters in the union uh, didn't like that. So they... Uh, they said, we're going to go on strike, too, until you hire our friends back, our, our two leaders. And the phone company refused. And uh, so they walked out. Now, um, I don't really have a pointer, so I'll just walk over here. This man here is John Heskett Wright. He's mayor in 1917 because he defeated this man here, Fagan Borland. Now, it... Uh, Borland is mayor in the first decade of the 20th century, the second decade of the 20th century, the third decade, and the fourth decade, all at different times, uh, and not necessarily consecutive terms all the time. In any case, uh, uh, John Heskett Wright booted him out. There's all kinds of stories about Fagan and Borland. Um, a friend of mine asked me to at least mention Maude Allen. I don't know if you know Yep, that's Maude Allen's boyfriend. Now, uh, Maude Allen was a woman in, the, I think it was 1890s. Fagan was already 
pretty prominent at the time. And uh, he was married to Julie. His wife was Julie Borland. And um, he uh, uh, had a girlfriend, so to speak, Maud Allen. Now, Maud Allen uh, was very possessive of Fagan and uh, caught him with, uh, now I'm trying to remember. Um, I better be careful. I don't want to tell him too wrong, but I will tell you. Saw, uh, Julia saw um, Maud on the, on the street and uh, shot her. Uh, but the room was pretty superficial. And uh, she recovered and continued to see Fagan. So Julia went back and shot her again. And this time, you're probably wondering why she isn't in jail. And, yeah, and I don't really have a good answer for that. Yeah, right. Well, not yet, but, but, but yeah, pr a prominent influential. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think there, yeah, there was an element of that, uh, what do they call it, uh, crime of passion. So Amon Allen's pretty seriously wounded the second time. She struggles, she recovers, doesn't leave town, continues to see Vor Fagan Borland, who must have just had been the ultimate ladies' man. I would think this would certainly have dissuaded me. But, uh, but, but in any case, uh, third time, and if I remember right, I think Julia disguised herself in blackface and wore men's clothing. But I'm not sure that's true. Tried, and, and this time she succeeded. She killed Julia. And yeah, I mean, Julie, I'm sorry, Julie killed Maud. And, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, was tried, uh, was acquitted. And uh, actually a friend of mine showed me some of the, the photos, the, the, or not photos, I'm sorry, showed me some of the letters. He had copies of the letters that were entered into the record because there was a, part of the trial was a, sending obscene images through the, the mail, but uh, 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 some of them involved the caricatures of, of uh, I think it was Maud, or maybe it was Maud sent it to Julie, I can't remember who, but uh, having a liaison with a pig. Well, uh, and uh, they were really nasty letters, and uh, uh, was, was acquitted of that. At any rate, I, I, well, she certainly was a strong woman, but uh, uh, I, I was going to say I digress, but maybe not. The, but Fagan, uh, what's interesting, stayed married to Julia the rest of his life. Probably was afraid to, well, probably afraid to leave her. But, uh, but in any case, uh, uh, he, there's all kinds of stories about Fagan. He's a legendary figure in Fort Smith. Um, so back to the main narrative. Uh, the, tell, the women worked in this building here, which is, what is that, fourth or fifth? No, I'm trying to think. No, no, it would be like ninth. I think it's ninth and um, A. And if you see this building back here, that, I'm, I'm telling you this because this, is, this is, uh, actually is relevant. That's the, I believe that is the uh, labor temple. So you see how close the big union meeting hall is to the, to the, the main switchboard or the, phone exchange there. And uh, what happened is, uh, so I told you about Wright, Wright Jake, John Heskett Wright was kind of a reform mayor. And he, uh, he, he they kicked out Fagan, um, who, uh, and then the phone girls went on strike. And what happened is, uh, so, so the, the women are striking, a lot of the other unions are coming out in solidarity and at least picketing with, with women. And in, I'm not sure if it's right there in that gap or if it's behind, but in an alleyway near the phone exchange, some people, we're not sure there are two accounts, dug up a gas main uh, as an act of vandalism that went into the building. And uh, I think the mayor later said he witnessed this and so did the police chief. And uh, he said there were kids, and he shooed them away. And some other people said, no, there were labor people trying to vandalize and harm the, the phone exchange. Uh, well, uh, they charge 
uh, John Heskett Wright with, and the police chief with nonfeasance. Does anyone know what nonfeasance is? There's misfeasance, there's malfeasance, and there's nonfeasance, which is basically nonfeasance is a failure to lawfully fulfill your duty in an office. Like this, they said, said uh, Mayor Wright shooed these vandals away, and he should have arrested them. So should have the police chief. Now, the mayor and the police chief were probably sympathetic to the strikers more than the uh, the telephone company. But they used that as an excuse to get um, John Heskett Wright thrown out of office. Uh, so he's, a judge disqualifies him, says, you know, this nonfeasance, and there was a bribery charge that was probably bogus. Um, but he's, he's out of office, and they're going to have a special election. Now, what I don't understand is if he's disqualified from office and he's already in the office, why did they let him run again? But, they, but sure enough, in this special election, which they considered a primary, going back to my opening remarks, uh, in this election, they let John Heskett Wright run again for mayor against a man named Arch Monroe, who I think is in that photo earlier, but I couldn't remember which one he is. Uh, Arch Monroe, uh, so they have a special election that's technically a primary, and if you know Fort Arkansas history back then, there really was only one party, the Democratic primary, or party, and, and their primary. If you won the Democratic primary, you probably were going to win office. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, they, the first vote, electing, I think, Arch Monroe by, I think, 300 votes, is on November 13, 1917. And that woman who cast the first vote is Dimple Johnson. And, uh, you see, is, is that next? Yeah. Oh, wait. There's what I was talking about earlier. You can see Arkansas there, first state. We can go back to that. But there's Dimple Johnson. And you may ask yourself, well, why do we know who the first woman was? Well, being the first vote of a woman in Fort Smith in Arkansas and, and, and the South, uh, Dimple wanted to be the first woman to vote. And, and, uh, there was another woman, Molly Williams, who was a grade school teacher, who said, no, I was the first woman to vote. So there was actually a dispute over who had voted first and earliest on November 13th. And so the, the newspaper went down and looked at the poll books where you had to sign in and all that. And they still have them today, you know. And, but, um, and determined that the polling station that Molly Williams voted at opened about 10 minutes late. And that Dimple voted right on the dot at 8 o'clock. And so they said that Dimple Johnson was the first woman in Fort Smith to vote. And we don't know how she voted, but uh, she was also the first female dental hygienist, a market researcher. She worked for the Southwest American, the newspaper there, for a time. And Jenny dug up, uh, when I was getting ready for this, this uh, spoke. We don't know what she spoke about, but she presented a paper at the eugenics conference in 1921 which uh, may have been bad, may have been good. We don't know what she said. but um, So in any case, um, so she, yep. So um, he's, uh, Arch Monroe's elected mayor. He's replacing John Heskett Wright. And meanwhile, this whole time, I think that's the, oh, I should point out, also going on in the fall of 1917, the Russian Revolution, October, November. So we're having our own little mini revolt here and in, in, uh, not quite as historic, but pretty interesting in Fort Smith. So uh, Arch Monroe, uh, the, the, basically the, 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 he sends a delegation to the Southwest, uh, Southwestern Bell Company, it's a phone company to talk to them because not only are the, are the strikers, those are the labor union, uh, fed up with the situation. The businessmen are starting to get a little fed up too, because if you shut down the phone system in the city, it's really hard. Especially, and we're getting close to Christmas season, so uh, so they're 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 kind of getting ticked off as well. So they send a like a basically a chamber of commerce delegation over to the phone company and say, look, you know, recognize the union, do something, but let's get this over with. That it was so bad, the phone service was so bad that they set up call boxes throughout the city. So if you had a fire or some 
crime that you wanted to report and your phone didn't really work anymore, you could walk down a couple blocks and use the call box. That's how, that's how bad it had gotten. Well, the phone company said, no, we're not going to, we're not going to, we're, we're going to hold fast. We're not going to uh, let a union in here. So, uh, and the businessmen kind of throw up their hands and the union gets together, probably at the labor temple, and they declare, if any of you know, this has happened so seldom even today, and it was not a common occurrence back then, a general strike. And a general strike is when every union walks out at the same time. And in fact, the, the trolley men, this is now December 1917, on a busy Christmas business day, I think it was like a, I think it was a Monday, and they, they just leave their trolleys. They're there on the tracks, wherever they decided, like there's, we're, we're all going on strike at 11 a.m. and everyone just left their trolleys and left, women had to walk home in the snow with their Christmas purchases. So, uh, and, and men and, and everyone else, I guess. And that went on for, I think, it's not real clear exactly when it was called off uh, and not all the unions went back at the same time, but it lasted about four or five days. And then what happened is the federal government came in, I think it may have even been the National Labor Relations Board or its predecessor, and they went into the phone company and said, you're not doing this anymore. Uh, this is over. Uh, and, and if you resist, basically I think they threatened to basically take over the telephone exchange. And so the phone company said, okay, and the, and the federal arbiters or mediators said, we'll settle all the hours and wages and all those issues, but they're coming back to work. And so they did. Within a matter of days, the phone system booted back up and the, the phone company recognized the union and, and the strike was over. But uh, what's interesting, and there's all so many side stories, but what's really notable to me is it was, a, it was you could say Holland American Fruit Company women tough on operators. It was women in organized labor unions striking that set off this chain of events that allowed, that ended up in a mayor getting booted out of office and then ultimately produced this, this public vote. There was a general election and Arch Monroe was the only candidate and surprise, surprise, he won. Uh, but, uh, but, and, and Fort Smith, uh, until I think really the right to work law was passed in the, or amendment was passed in the 40s, had a really strong uh, labor movement, uh, maybe not as strong as then, but um, Dan Hogan ran for governor, I think 1910, he was a socialist candidate. He was from Sebastian County, he had a newspaper called The Southern Worker. Um, and uh, um, you had, and what's interesting is if you look back at the the Beige Denman lockout and and that whole controversy, which is fascinating in and of itself, um, the uh, it, it it just uh, you had a, a heavy political element there. Oh, I, I know what I was going to say. The the what's interesting in that one is you had the Feds on the side, as you see with the cavalry coming in and that kind of thing, on the side of the mine owners. But if you read kind of between the lines the state authorities, the prosecutor, the sheriff, all the local officials were on the union side, which is really kind of unusual, even, especially then, maybe. But um, I've, uh, that's what I wanted to, to tell you about, was especially this story in 1917. There are all kinds of side stories, like they uh, tried to basically uh, kick all the prostitutes out of the city they said any woman of ill repute could not resist in the, reside in the city limits. And a um, woman who ran what is today's Miss Laura's, the visitor center where my wife worked, uh, not in, not in the, that capacity, but, but uh, uh, <laughs> for the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, Bertha Gale Dean was the madam. She succeeded. Uh, Laura, and she sued, and her her representative was, or her legal representative, her lawyer, was uh, William Ben Cravens, who was a congressman from from Fort Smith, and then later 
before and then later a congressman in the 20s and 30s to his death, um, he, uh, he argued successfully that you, you can't do that. You can't say someone can't live in a city. You can incarcerate them. If they commit a serious enough crime, you can send them off to prison, but you can't say they can't reside in the city. And that that involved a, basically an unfair takings of her property because she owned the house, et cetera. And, uh, but there are all kinds of little things that are going on this year. I mean, there, there's room in there for lots of academic articles and papers and that kind of thing. But I'm pretty much done. So if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. And um, I've got a, yeah. Uh, enough, I think, uh, more than the margin of victory. Yeah, I think uh, quite a few did. I'm not, I'm not sure the final tally. Um, I'm not sh I'm trying to think if I ever even heard that reported, but uh, there was like people, you know, you, I, I, in terms of exact numbers, but yeah, so I, I would say, and Fort Smith's a city of, I'm trying to think, 20 to 30,000 at the time, maybe, and uh, so there were, you know, quite a few qualified women voters there, but uh, anything else? Anyone? Oh, okay, and, and make it clear that you weren't ever, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, here, this, this is another Fagan story, so Fagan's first mayor, I think he was elected in 1907, when they passed an ordinance uh, designating a red light district in Fort Smith, and in that red light district, which is around the riverfront, where Miss Laura still is today, and the only surviving Wardello there, their uh, prostitution would be legal and regulated. And they had a city health inspector who would check the women every month for venereal disease. Uh, they had a prostitute's license. They had a madam's license, and it was regulated. What's interesting is the license fee was the same amount as the fine for being a prostitute or a madam in Fort Smith. It was actually the charge was, I think, inmate of a house of ill repute or inmate of a house of prostitution or keeper of a house. Uh, in any case, uh, so from 1907 to 1923, prostitution is legal there, officially. That's what's also peculiar about the crackdown in 1917, because I remember this going, when I, I did, for the Arkansas Historic Preservation Program, I did in 1994, did a study of the red light district and went through the police dockets, and you can see I, I didn't match, ever match it up to a calendar, but it's like, okay, the first Monday of every month, they round up everyone, bring them in, charge them, fine them, send them back out, and then they do it again the next month. Well, in 1917, when John Heskett writes, and in, 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 uh, when it's still, this is before legalization, but when Wright is mayor, suddenly there are these police raids again. And I, was, I remember reading, looking at primary schools, well, how can they do that? It's legal in the row, you can't arrest people for something, there's a city ordinance that, that makes it legal, but they just did it anyway. So to, to force these women, women out as part of sort of rights uh, reform zeal. So uh, it's legal there, it's regulated. And when I say regulated, not just the health stuff, it was like no minors could be in a house of prostitution. Uh, you, you, each house had to be uh, fenced. They, women couldn't be visible through the windows, those sorts of things. So it was, it's basically an admission of, of uh, the system that had been going on for a long time. Let's just put up, you know, put up, uh, dismiss the pr pretense of, of what we're doing here. But in uh, 1923, there's another, and Fagan Borland is a mayor again at this time and is booted out of office by the Klan this time. Now, Borland was, uh, I don't, oh, he's a Methodist, yeah. In fact, if you go to First Methodist Church, there's a big bell tower there. That was paid for by Fagan Borland. But, uh, um, but in, in any case, uh, um, he had a lot of friends who were Catholics. He had a lot of friends in the African-American community and voters who supported him. And uh, the Klan came in, and they ran a guy named D.L. Ford, who defeated him off as very 
controver another controversial election, uh, which Fagan was involved, but that brought an end to prostitution because uh, that was also an aspect of the Klan was, you know, race purity and vice, clamping down on vice and that kind of thing. And I could talk about uh, prostitution history in Fort Smith for a while, but that's that's the believe it or not the short answer. Uh, any any anyone have any other questions? You're welcome to come up and talk to me afterwards. I'll hang around for a little bit. There's some postcards on 